Good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship as the church family of Beverly Baptist Church this morning. My name's Emily and I'm going to be leading our service this morning and later Phil, our minister, is going to be sharing with us in the final part in our series on the book of Nehemiah. Let's start our time together by focusing on God in words from Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars, he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. We wait in hope for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I'm going to hand over to Ian and Julia now, who are going to lead us as we lift our songs of worship to our faithful and unfailing God. Let's raise our voices together and sing together, Great is your faithfulness.
choose to worship, I choose to love. It was playing in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds, and my soul is unraveling. And Julia. We've got a few notices just to share about uh, things going on in the life of the church. Um, as usual, after our service this morning, we're having a Zoom coffee and chat. That's at half past 11, and it's the usual link. It's been sent out as a reminder. So uh, do, do join us for a coffee and a chance to catch up and pray together after the service if you can. Also, for the first time this afternoon, we're having an actual physical gathering at King's Church at four o'clock. Uh, obviously, numbers are limited, um, uh, but there are still a few spaces available. So if you'd like to go and you haven't yet booked a place, um, either mention it to Phil in the Zoom chat after the service or send him a quick text or email just to let him know. Um, if you are going to attend this afternoon, it might be useful just to go back and look over the email that explains some of the um, arrangements and what to expect from the service, because obviously it will be a little bit different to usual gatherings. But please do be praying about that this afternoon. Uh, as you'll know, if you're regularly watching these services, we like to celebrate special occasions with crunches. 
so if you know of a birthday or um, an anniversary or another celebration coming up, please do let the church office know and our now expanded team of Crunchy Fairies um, are ready and waiting to deliver something just to help us share that celebration with you. Um, and we've got a, a particular celebration this week, um, a lot of you may have already heard, but Caitlin, who's Andy and Wendy's younger daughter, she got engaged in the past week or so to Jack, so we do send lots of love and congratulations to them. With many of our schools and colleges starting back this week, it would be good to pause now to take time to pray for our schools and for our educational institutions, for the, the children, the young people and the staff who work there. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a prayer walk this morning just to prompt us in our prayers. We pray for nurseries and preschools. With this younger age group who only have a limited understanding of what's been happening over the past six months, we pray that they'll enjoy being back with friends and learning through fun activities. We pray for the staff there, that they'll be able to create a really good environment for them. We pray for our primary schools as they try and get back to some kind of normality this term. We pray that the children will be happy, comfortable and not too unsettled by change. We pray for peace for teachers and parents that any anxieties would be calmed and they can have confidence in safety for everyone. And we pray for teachers and children as they work together to catch up with work that's been missed. We pray for management teams too, as they make decisions in the ever-changing landscape of guidelines and regulations. We pray for all of our secondary schools. We pray particularly for the new Year 7 students starting secondary school after the disruption of their last term at primary school. Help them as they settle in, that they make new friends and get used to the new environment and ways of learning. We pray for the other students going back after a long break from formal lessons. We pray that they'll be able to catch up with what they've missed and hit the ground running with fresh enthusiasm for learning. We pray particularly for those whose studies for GCSE and A-level were disrupted and who are now going into year 11 or year 13 concerned about what they've missed and what will happen in the year ahead. Lord bless the teachers and other staff who have so much to deal with on top of the normal challenges and pressures of working in school. Give them peace, energy, patience and strength. We pray for further education colleges, sixth form colleges and also for universities, for staff and students picking up again after the disruption before the summer. Where teaching activities are still disrupted or being carried out online, we pray that you'll help everyone adapt to new ways of working and that they'll be able to learn effectively. We pray for students just starting at these institutions, that they'll be able to settle in and make friends despite any social distancing arrangements. We pray too for out of school activities, for sports clubs, performing arts activities, all sorts of other clubs and activities that are so important to our children and young people. We pray that these will be able to continue as normally as possible and we pray that those running them will be able to adapt to new ways of working. And let's pray too for the witness of Christians in all of our places of learning, both students and members of staff, that God will shine through them wherever they are. And we pray for the work of the Beverly Schools Christian Trust in our local schools, particularly at this time when they're unsure what access they'll be able to have to different places of learning. We ask that they'll be able to have positive conversations with schools and find creative ways of working. So Father, we do offer up to you all of our places of learning um, for all of the children, the young people, all of the staff, all of those involved in decision making at local and national level, that the start of this new academic year will be positive uh, rather than challenging. If you have children or young people in your household, uh, do pray with them about the term ahead. And perhaps it would be good to take a look at the church contact list and pray through that for all the children in the church as they go back to school. And also for those who work in different educational institutions too. And I'm sure you know other young people and children um, and staff in schools and universities that you can be praying for over the coming days. 
let's remember that this is a really important time for all of them. And let's bring our prayers to God. Let's continue together in the worship as we sing together, You Are a Holy God. is the last in our series looking at the book of Nehemiah where we've been finding out about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem after the return from exile to Babylon. Before we read from the final chapters of the book and then Phil shares some thoughts with us about that, James and Alex have produced an animation to remind us of the story so far so we'll hand over to them. Nehemiah lived in Babylon, but he heard that the walls of his home city, Jerusalem, were broken down. He prayed to God to ask him to help rebuild the city. 
He worked for the king and he got permission from the king to return to Jerusalem to lead the rebuilding of the city. When he got there, Nehemiah inspected all the broken walls and gates to see what needed to be done. And then he got all the other people in Jerusalem excited about helping too. Everybody helped rebuild the wall, men and women, young and old, from lots of different places. Even people who had never done building work before got involved. Some people who lived nearby didn't want Jerusalem to become strong again, so they plotted to attack them to stop the rebuilding. So Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem prayed to God to protect them, and as they worked on the wall, they made sure they were ready to fight as well. Some of the people of Jerusalem weren't being fair in how they treated people who were poor. Although he was very busy leading the rebuilding work, Nehemiah took time to sort this out because he knew that God wanted their society to be fair for everyone. They finished rebuilding the wall. To mark the occasion, they read from God's word to remind themselves how God had been faithful to them. And they had a feast to celebrate. Reading God's law reminded the people of all the ways they had let God down. So they spent time telling God what they had done wrong and asking him to forgive them. They held a dedication service to offer the newly rebuilt city to God. There was lots of singing and celebration because God had helped them rebuild the walls just as he had promised he would. We are looking today at Nehemiah chapters 12 and 13. Rather than read the full chapters, we are going to read several sections that help us follow what happens. We will read chapter 12 verses 27 to 31, 38 and 40 to 47, then chapter 13 verses 4 to 22. Chapter 12, the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps and lyres. The musicians were also brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Nephetatites, from Beth Gilgal and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth. For the musicians had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed to the top of the wall to the right, towards the Dung Gate. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Eliakim, Messiah, Miniamin, Micaiah, Elioenai, Zechariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets, and also Messiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehohanan, Malkijar, Elam, and Ezer. The choir sang under the direction of Jezrehiah. And on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites for Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the musicians and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions for the musicians and the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. Chapter 
Chapter 13, Nehemiah's Final Reforms Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Elishib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God, with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe and a Levite named Pediah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah their assistant because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our gods brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem, but I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again I will arrest you. From that time on they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. So we're coming to the end of our series in Nehemiah. Seems like a long time ago we were standing in the court of Persia as Nehemiah hears the devastating news of the state of the city of Jerusalem and nervously asks the king for permission to go and rebuild. We've seen how his faithfulness to God's calling and lots of prayer has enabled him to acquire the materials and the personnel needed to encourage the people to work as a team to overcome opposition and to see the walls built. We've seen also how this was not just about rebuilding walls how there was a need for people's hearts to be in the right place, for a society built on justice and God's law. We've heard how that law was read and the people repented for their past failings and joyfully committed to following God's ways in the future. And now, having rebuilt the physical city and the foundations of society, we come to the culmination, the great celebration. Two huge parties of priests and Levites, musicians and assorted dignitaries process in opposite directions around the city walls. 
walking round the whole city. One group up the west side, the other at the east, and meeting at the temple. A great celebration. Music, worship, sacrifices, rejoicing, feasting. This is a culmination of the great restoration, yes, of the physical city, but, but also of the restoration of the worshipping life of the community of Israel. They're back from exile. They're on their way to a new life as the committed people of God, dedicated to him and his way and knowing his blessing. But all is not quite as it seems. Let's look beneath the surface a little. Nigel mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the book of Nehemiah is actually the second half of what is one book in the Hebrew Bible. The first half is what we call the book of Ezra. And Ezra tells the story of the first Jewish people returning from exile, rebuilding the altar, beginning to offer sacrifices, and then eventually, after a pause due to some opposition from outside, completing the construction of a new temple. That is some 60 years before Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem. Ezra himself then enters the story, being sent from Babylon to re-establish the worship of God, to read and interpret the law and to guide the people in how they should live. Ezra arrives in Jerusalem a full 14 years before Nehemiah. So we might expect that 60 years after the temple has been dedicated, 14 years after Ezra arrives to instruct the people, we would find that the temple system is established, the sacrifices are being offered, the priests and Levites are leading the people in worship and in the law of God. But then we come to Nehemiah 12, 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem. Far from working in the temple courts as they should, the Levites had kind of gone into hiding, dispersed amongst the other returning exiles. The mus musicians too, who should have been provided with accommodation in the temple courts so they could fulfil their duties, have instead built and moved into villages in the surrounding area outside of the city. And indeed, if we cast our mind back a couple of weeks when Ezra appeared on the scene after the completion of the walls, he reads for days from the book of the law and it's obvious that most of the people have not heard much of this before. They've certainly not been listening to and following that law. Further on, down in Nehemiah 12, we find it's only now, at the rededication of the wall, that a system is put in place to deal with tithes and offerings, which were the means of payment for the priests and the Levites. They were essential to enable them to devote themselves to worship of God without being distracted by the need to earn a living, so it's no wonder they haven't been doing their job, they've not been being paid. And so for 60 years, the temple has been built, but not operational, at least not nearly to its full extent, despite the presence for the last 14 years of Ezra, who came with that purpose, to set the people up with the worship of God. So Nehemiah sets things straight. But as we read on in chapter 13, we find that that doesn't last. After 12 years in Jerusalem, Nehemiah returns to Babylon. And while he's away, we find that those storerooms to keep the tithes and offerings to pay the priests and Levites are given away again. And to none other than Tobiah the Ammonite, who had been one of the leaders of the opposition to the rebuilding of the walls. And who, as an Ammonite should never have been allowed into the temple, never mind given rooms there. And as we read on in chapter 13, we find a whole catalogue of ways in which the people had drifted away again from the law of God. Not looking after the Levites and priests to enable the worship of God, not keeping the Sabbath, and more. The enthusiasm with which the people celebrate and dedicate themselves to God is barely skin deep. Without Nehemiah to keep an eye on them, they very quickly return to their old ways. They forget God and his laws. I titled this morning's sermon when we put the service plans together, 
Dedication for the future. Should perhaps be dedications, plural. Because the people dedicated themselves when the temple was completed back in the book of Ezra. They dedicated themselves when Ezra read the law on completion of the walls of the city. They dedicated themselves on the day of celebration we read about, about today with the choirs and the music. They dedicated themselves again in chapter 13 at least twice when Nehemiah pulls them up short and they need to recommit to living as they should. There's a constant process of rededication and falling away. Recommitment to the law of God and then forgetting that same law. It's a cycle we see through these books, but actually we see it through the whole of the Old Testament. The very carrying off of the people into exile in Babylon in the first place was a result from them having fallen away from who they should have been as the people of God. And the whole return of the exiles, which culminates in Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the city, was in itself a, a rededication, however imperfect we have seen it was. It's a constant cycle for the people of God in the Old Testament. But it's no different for us either, is it? As evangelical Christians, we talk about a personal commitment to faith in Christ, so something that we are all called to make. And that's really important. But it's not just a one-off thing that we do and then forget about. As Baptists, we love to see people professing faith through the waters of baptism. And that symbolic act, that sacrament, is something that we only do once. But it doesn't mean that once we've dedicated ourselves to God in that way, we will never look back. We all know that experience, I'm sure. The times when we have sat in despair, possibly even in tears, and we've said to God, never again. We've committed to rededicating ourselves to him for the future. And it's different for each of us what triggers that. Never again will I allow myself to get so angry at that individual. Never again will I waste an evening lying on the sofa watching TV instead of doing what needs to be done. Never again will I avoid my friends when I know it would do me and them good for us to meet. Never again will I access that pornographic website. Never again will I place that bet. And the list could go on. We repent. We offer ourselves to God. We commit to living according to his laws. And we're genuine. We mean it. This is not just pretending for show or to get ourselves off the hook. We know God's way is best and we genuinely want to follow him. But then, not much later, we find ourselves back at that place of despair, having fallen back into our own ways. But there's hope for us in how Nehemiah responds to the people here. And I believe in doing so, he models how God responds to us. Because the very fact that there are these continual rededications shows grace and mercy and a recognition of the weakness of human beings. Time and again, Ezra and Nehemiah call the people to repentance and the people repent and they accept that and they rededicate them to the way of God. Never do they give up. Never do they say, you obviously don't mean it. You can't keep to it, so why bother? Nehemiah goes back to Babylon for a time, but only when he thinks he's got everything set up correctly. And then he comes back because he's worried, he's concerned to see how the people are getting on. And yes, he rebukes those who are at fault, sometimes harshly and violently in parts of chapter 13. But with very few exceptions, he then purifies them and restores them. Chapter 13, verses 8 to 9, he, he clears Tobiah out of the temple. Then he purifies the rooms and puts them back to their proper use. Verse 11, he rebukes the officials, but then he calls them together and stations them at their posts. Verses 15 to 22, we read about how he rebukes the nobles for not observing the Sabbath. He warns them. He stations his men at the gates to keep out those who are wishing to trade 
on the Sabbath. But then he purifies the Levites and gives them that job to do. Time and again the same pattern. You have messed up. Here's what you've done wrong. Don't underestimate that. But now, go purify yourself and get back to work doing what you should have been doing all along. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, restoration. Because Nehemiah recognises that's how God is. That repeated refrain throughout chapter 13, indeed it appears throughout the book. Asking God to remember him because of his faithfulness to his calling. 13, chapter 13 verse 22. Remember me for this also my God and show mercy to me according to your great love. It's the character of God we see repeated throughout the Bible, culminating in Jesus. Jesus, who when asked by Peter if he should forgive his brother seven times, replied no, 77 times. A God who forgives again and again when we come back to him. A God who is always willing to accept home the wayward child, like the father in the parable that Jesus told. A God who time and again picks us up, wipes us down and recommissions us in his service. So what shall we take from all this today? Well, firstly, as we hear this story of the whole community of God's people rejoicing and celebrating and the music and the worship and, and such a loud celebration, it could be heard miles away. Because the city was complete. They had an identity again. They had safety again. They had the promise of living in peace and security. And they thanked God for his goodness for his gracious provision, for all he had done for them. There's something here for us as a community. In this time where much of our security, at least in terms of this world, has been broken down. When our church has been unable to meet physically. When our pastoral care has been limited. When we have been lonely, bored, afraid. When we have been uncertain what the future holds, when we still don't know how and when and where we might all be able to gather together again to worship in the way that we long to do. Are we nonetheless prepared to dedicate ourselves to God's service, to begin to be preparing now for the day when all of this will be behind us? When those external structures will have been rebuilt in whatever form that takes. Are we willing to play our part, however small it may be, in the process of that rebuilding? This afternoon a small number of us will gather in person to worship for the first time in six months. It's a small step. But it's part of a process of rebuilding. Now please hear me, I'm not saying that we should all be there. We can't anyway, for practical reasons, there isn't space. And many of us have good reasons for feeling that this is not the right gathering for us at this time. But please pray for those who do gather. That it will be a time of blessing. A time of rejoicing. Even if we can't sing and make noise that will be heard miles away. That still there will be a sense of celebration. A real, tangible experience of the presence of God. And dedication to his service in that place. And that we can take from that and begin to build more opportunities for worship. And for all of us, are we preparing our hearts and looking forward in faith that God will complete that process of rebuilding? Looking with eager anticipation to the day when we will be able to rejoice and celebrate together and commit ourselves once again to being his people gathered in one place, dedicated 
to his service. Please God, may that day come soon. But for each of us on a personal level, we don't have to wait for the church to be gathered again, to dedicate ourselves or rededicate ourselves to service of God. Wherever you are right now, he calls you to celebrate what he has done for you and to commit to following him into the future. You may feel you're unworthy. Why would God ever want me? All I do is let him down. I failed him too much this time. You could never take me back. Well, yes, you are unworthy. And if you don't feel that, that's when I'd be worried. Because it shows that you haven't begun to grasp your need of God's grace. Yes, you are unworthy. But you are not unloved. God in Jesus, as he suffers and dies on the cross, carrying all your unworthiness and shame, but rises to a new life of freedom. And that's the pattern that he offers to us, that we can die to that unworthiness and rise again to new life. And in that death, he has shown you that his love will stop at nothing to win you back. And he stands with arms open wide to welcome you as you seek to commit again to his service. And you know, as you do so, the rejoicing in heaven is unimaginably greater than even the rejoicing in Jerusalem as Nehemiah rededicated the walls. As each one of us comes in repentance and faith to Jesus, there is joy among the angels. A foretaste of that great day to come when we will all gather in his presence in the new Jerusalem. With a celebration like nothing ever seen. A celebration that will continue for all eternity. So now is the opportunity to dedicate your life to God. For the first time or a recommitment from whatever point you are at now. To do so with joy. In the full knowledge that just like the people of Nehemiah's day, there'll be those backward steps. Those times when you drift away again from God's way. But rejoicing that you can know however many times you fall away. Jesus has borne all the consequences of your weakness in himself on the cross. And he always stands ready to accept you back with love, with grace and with joy. So I'm going to give us an opportunity now to respond. And if you felt God speaking to you by his spirit this morning, calling you to say once again, Lord, forgive me for who I have been. And Lord, I commit to following your way. I'm going to read some words of a poem called A New Sheet. I was given this first as a, a, a copy of it as a student event, I think it was, while I was at university. And it spoke to me then. And I pray that it will speak to some of us now as we hear it. And after I've read these words, I'll just leave some space for each of us to reflect and respond in our hearts to God. It's written by a school teacher. He came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. I took his sheet, all soiled and blotted, and gave him a new one, all unspotted. And into his tired heart I cried, do better now, my child. I came to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day, all soiled and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. 
and into my tired heart he cried, Do better now, my child. Let's close our service together now as we sing together, Be Thou My Vision. worship this morning and thank you for everyone who's contributed to our service to Phil for opening up God's word to us to Ian and Julia for leading our sung worship to James and Alex for the wonderful Lego animation and to Naomi and Mary for helping with the reading um, and not forgetting Josh uh, who's been doing all the technical stuff this week 
If there's anything that you'd like to discuss about this morning service or anything you'd like to pray with somebody about, please do get in touch with somebody from the church. If you're not a regular member of the church and you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us on contactus at beverlybaptist.com. We hope to see some of you later for online coffee and chat at 11.30. Time to go and put the kettle on now. Uh, and we'll see hopefully some of you as well for our physical gathering at four o'clock this afternoon. I'm going to close our time together by reading Psalm 126. Although we can't be absolutely certain about the dating of this psalm, it was probably written after the exiles returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. It begins by giving thanks to God for all he has done and asks him to continue to bring restoration, renewal and joy. So let's make this our prayer. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Father, thank you for your love and faithfulness, for all you have done for us. What amazing things you have done. And Lord, we ask you now to turn our sadness to joy, our tears to songs. Restore us now as streams renew the desert. Amen. Thank you.